Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds, and welcome to video notes for topic 9.6, which is ocean warming. Our objective for the day is to be able to explain the causes and the effects of ocean warming, and the skill that we'll practice at the end of today's video is describing environmental problems. So we'll start out today by talking about the relationship between atmospheric warming and oceanic warming. And I want to point out here that the title of this slide reminds us that it's a two-way relationship. So the atmosphere can warm the ocean, and the ocean can then pass some of that heat and that warmth back to the atmosphere. So it's a two-way relationship. So we should know that as our planet warms, as the greenhouse gas uh, gases in the atmosphere radiate heat back to Earth, the ocean is going to absorb a lot of that heat. And so as the atmosphere warms, so does the ocean. So infrared radiation released by Earth's surface, whether that's ocean surface or land surface or ice surface, it's going to be captured by the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and radiated back to Earth. Now, a lot of that heat is going to be passed into the ocean. We can see a map here courtesy of NOAA, which is going to show us the change in heat content in the ocean. So we can see that much of the ocean is taking on increasing amounts of heat from 1993 to 2019. And so again, I wanna point out that this is due to water's high specific heat. Water as a molecule is able to absorb a lot of heat relative to other molecules. And that is going to take a lot of warmth and a lot of heat out of the atmosphere because water has such a high specific heat. So it's really good at taking on excess heat from the atmosphere and storing it. So this has led to observations that the ocean has taken on up to 90% of the heating that's occurred on Earth. And so land and water do not heat equally. The oceans take on a lot more of that heating. Now, what's important to understand here is that the thermal haline circulation is going to distribute that heating. So the heating is mixed throughout the ocean. We've seen that in instances such as the Gulf Coast stream, it's gonna distribute some of that heat to Europe. So there's going to be some mixing of this heating and it doesn't just all occur in one place. So this is a really beneficial aspect that the oceans uh, perform for Earth's climate. What we wanna also understand here is that there is a flux or a movement of heat between the ocean and the atmosphere. And what's really important to understand is that the ocean can hold heat for a very long time and slowly release that heat into the atmosphere for decades to come. Uh, so there are many scientists who have concluded or estimated that even if we were to stop increasing global greenhouse gas concentrations, immediately right now, that the atmosphere would continue to warm for decades due to the warmth released by the ocean. And so what you start to see here is that climate change and global warming are really complex issues to understand. The basics of the greenhouse effect are simple, but the flux or the movement of heat between the atmosphere and the ocean is very complex. From an AP environmental science standpoint though, we just need to understand that the high specific heat of water enables it to take on a lot of heat from Earth's atmosphere and from Earth's land and then that that heat can be slowly released back into the atmosphere and back into the land later. Think of it almost as like a seesaw where it's swinging back and forth in different directions and it's leveling out, but that takes decades to unfold. Now we'll take a look at the effects of ocean warming on marine organisms or marine life. So the first thing we need to know is that warmer water holds less oxygen. So this is gonna be really important for species that require a large amount of oxygen, especially fish and large mammals like whales. And so this can cause respiratory stress or suffocation if the water gets so warm that there's not enough oxygen for the respiration of these animals anymore. Another important thing to understand is that migratory routes and breeding seasons can be altered by increases in ocean temperature. So we can see here there's a map of many different ocean species whose migratory routes have been altered in different ways due to the changing of ocean temperatures. Now this could be due to an overall rise in average ocean temperature in the region they live in, or the change in the timing of temperature changes of the ocean. So naturally, oceans will warm during warmer summer months and cool during colder winter months. But when the timing of those events is disrupted or changed, that can lead to changes in mating or breeding patterns. So fish may migrate earlier due to changes in the ocean temperature occurring earlier in the season. So this is really important to understand because it can disrupt their breeding habits. It can make it harder for them to reproduce. It could also disrupt the timing of their food sources. So if food sources occur when the ocean water changes to a warmer temperature, that could lead to fish, if they don't adjust their migratory patterns, arriving later than their food source. And so that's a problem as well. So we need to think about not only the increase in the average ocean temperature, but the timing of those changes. Another issue that can occur is habitat loss. 
So specifically, we'll focus on coral bleaching and the loss of the coral reef ecosystem in the future in this video. Um, but we also should be aware that beyond just bleaching, ocean temperature uh, and ocean depth can change as a result of melting polar and glacial ice. So these warm and shallow, sunny waters that are really critical for algae growth uh, that help the coral reef ecosystem thrive, that can go away as these shallow waters along the coastline become deeper due to melting sea ice, as well as thermal expansion. Toxic algae blooms are another potential threat to marine species that occur when the water becomes warmer. So these toxic blue-green algae prefer warmer waters. And when those waters become warmer, that really drives their growth. We have a picture of them here so we can kind of understand what this is going to look like. It's going to be this thick coating on the top of the water. So they can be toxic because of the compounds that they release. So they can actually kill organisms due to the toxicity, you know, the effects they have on these organisms metabolically. But they can also block the sunlight out so they can kind of choke out uh, aquatic plant growth beneath the surface of the water. And then when they die, remember, they get broken down by bacteria. That's an oxygen consuming process. And then so they can lead to hypoxia or decreased oxygen levels in the water. Another thing to point out is that because algae decrease the albedo of the surface of the water, they can actually absorb heat themselves and lead to even more warming. And so there's just a whole host of problems that can come with blue green algae blooms that occur with warmer water temperatures. Now we'll take a look at some of the effects of climate change on coral reef ecosystems. Remember that coral reef ecosystems are extremely biodiverse. They're among the most biodiverse um, biomes on earth. And so they provide homes and food sources to a ton of different species. They're great uh, ecotourism attractions. And so there's a lot of reasons that we should be concerned about the loss of the coral reef ecosystem and why we should understand how it's happening. One thing I wanna point out on this slide is that many of these effects are generalized climate change effects as, a spo as uh, opposed to warming and ocean acidification specifically. We will go into great depth on ocean warming and ocean acidification. And so I'm gonna breeze through those in this overall infographic here a little bit. So first we should know that ocean warming is going to cause some thermal stress to the coral reef ecosystem. It can cause the fish or the other organisms that populate it, that contribute uh, services to it, to become stressed and not be able to survive there. It can lead to coral bleaching, which we'll focus on in depth at the end of this video. It can also make the organisms that live in the coral reef, the coral themselves, the animals, more prone to disease. And so that's a problem that comes with warming. Then we have sedimentation. So as sea level rise occurs, you can see here the sediment, which they're representing in blue, uh, can kind of smother the cor coral or prevent the photosynthetic algae that live in the coral from receiving the sunlight that they need. Then we have changes in storm patterns. So as storm patterns become more severe, and occur for longer periods of time, that can cause just physical damage to the reef. Huge waves can bash the reef and, and break it apart, and so that can disturb the ecosystem. Changes in precipitation. So we have increased runoff of fresh water, either from melting ice caps or just increased rainfall. That can dilute the salinity or the saltiness of the water, and that can change the habitat for many of the organisms who rely on that you know, salty ocean water. We can have altered ocean currents. This could again, change the flow of waves. It could lead to waves that are stronger in a different direction that move nutrients away from an area or towards an area where it didn't occur before. It can redistribute heat and sediments and all sorts of things in the ocean. And so when you have an ecosystem that is uniquely adapted to existing ocean currents, when they change, that can prove to be a disruption. And then we will talk in great depth in our next video. It will be entirely dedicated to ocean acidification. So suffice it to say here that as the ocean decreases in pH as it becomes more acidic, that's a threat to the actual structure and the ability of coral to build the reef. And again, there will be an entire video dedicated to this process coming up uh, after this one. And we'll wrap up today by talking about coral bleaching. So before we get into what bleaching is, we have to remind ourselves of what a coral reef ecosystem actually is. So we have to remember that what characterizes and what really defines this unique ecosystem is a symbiotic relationship, specifically a mutualistic relationship, between coral, which are tiny animals, on the individuals are called polyps, and a class of algae called zooxanthellae. And so zooxanthellae, I'll say that three times fast, are a class of algae, and they live in the cells of the coral. So they actually live right in their intercellular spaces. They live in between them in the reef. And it's a really beneficial relationship where the algae are supplying sugar, which is the primary energy source or the primary food source for 
the coral, the little animals. And then the coral are supplying carbon dioxide through respiration, which of course the algae use for photosynthesis, but they're also supplying uh, detritus, which is partially broken down dead organic matter. And that's gonna have nutrients that the algae also need. So it's a really beneficial relationship. Now the algae are what give the coral reef its color. Their presence in these little coral spaces are what actually give the reef all of these unique colors. And so bleaching is the loss of those algae. So we can see here that due to the narrow temperature range that the algae have, when the ocean warms a little bit, many times they are expelled or they leave the coral reef. And when they leave, the reef loses its color. That's why we refer to it as bleaching. It actually takes on kind of a white, you know, crusty old sort of bone color. And that's what characterizes coral bleaching. Now, this can also be caused by pollutants. And so pollutants from land, things like pesticides from agriculture or sunscreen, even from beachgoers, those are things that can also contaminate the water to the extent that the algae can no longer survive in the coral reef. And so they can leave as a result of water pollution as well. Again, what I want to point out here is that this coral bleaching occurs, the change in color occurs because the algae have left. Now, one thing I want to point out is a misconception bleached coral are not dead. They're still alive, uh, but you can think of them as sort of hanging on, no longer thriving, and that they're now very vulnerable. They have had their main food source, their main energy source, which is the algae, removed. And so they're going to have a lot less energy. They're going to be immunocompromised, so they're not going to be able to fight off disease as well. And so they are severely stressed when they're bleached. Now, if the conditions in the ocean become more favorable, the algae can return. So it's not an irreversible process initially, but think of bleached coral as kind of on life support. It's kind of on its last legs. And without the return of the algae, it's going to be difficult for those coral to continue to survive indefinitely. So for practice of 9.6 today, I want you to describe one climate change related threat to the coral reef ecosystem, and then describe one climate change related threat to a marine species other than coral.